This is a story about miracles. It's also a story about dedication, determination, and love. Hello, I'm Leah Mortensen, and it is my pleasure to share with you the incredible journey that has created life-changing miracles for many who have suffered so much, but today, suffer no more. How is this possible? Well, thanks to research and perseverance, an international team of dedicated scientists and doctors assembled the pieces and eventually solved an intricate diabetes puzzle. It's a discovery that has made medical history and took decades to realize, but the result is a breathtaking cure for many with genetic forms of diabetes. During this program, we'll share the fascinating story of this discovery and introduce you to some of the heroes that helped to make it happen. And there's another side to this story, one you rarely get to see. The human side, the personal side, the triumphant side. For this scientific breakthrough has had a profound impact on everyone whose lives it has touched. From the doctors and scientists, to the grateful families who had long hoped and prayed for a diabetes cure, but never in their wildest dreams imagined it would come in the form of a simple pill. They are as young as only a few weeks, and some as old as 65. They come from every corner of the world and represent all walks of life. Yet they all share the same incredible journey. Each was diagnosed with what doctors at the time only knew to call type 1 or type 2 diabetes. But because of an incredible breakthrough in science, each one of these courageous people is now insulin free. Each has made what is called a transition, meaning a switch from daily insulin injections to taking pills with a glass of water. Before this life-changing discovery, their bodies couldn't produce insulin on their own, but now they can, thanks to this breakthrough and a common and inexpensive oral medication. This may sound unbelievable, but as scientists delved deep into genetic research, they discovered other forms of diabetes that are very different from either type 1 or type 2. These newly understood genetic types are called monogenic diabetes. And despite increased public awareness, many in the mainstream medical community do not yet know about these genetic forms and why different treatments are far more effective than insulin shots. But before we take a closer look at monogenic diabetes, it would help to have a basic understanding of what diabetes is and the enormous impact it has on our population. According to the Centers for Disease Control, there are more than 25 million Americans and 350 million people worldwide suffering with various forms of diabetes. That number will escalate to 44 million in the U.S. by the year 2034, with an annual cost of $336 billion. There's no question, diabetes has a tight grip on our health and economy, and is among the most serious health problems the U.S. will face in the next 25 years. So who is at risk of getting diabetes? Is it something we're born with? Is it genetic? And what is the difference between types 1 and 2? And if diabetes isn't well controlled, what are the long-term health consequences? We turn to Dr. Lewis Philipson, director of the Kovler Diabetes Center at the University of Chicago, to explain. Dr. Philipson is recognized as one of the world's leading experts on the disease. Well, diabetes is many things. It's really about the body not making enough insulin to process foods and to use the foods that we eat. Insulin is made in the pancreas and it's one of the most important hormones in the body. In type 1 diabetes, the ability of the body to make insulin is almost completely destroyed. So there's really no insulin at all and people just cannot live without insulin. In type 2 diabetes, there's a lack of insulin which gets progressively worse over time. So people can do well in the beginning, but over years may need pills or even taking insulin itself in order to survive. So why do we care about how to take care of people with diabetes? The most important thing is that uncontrolled blood sugars lead to a variety of important complications. When the blood sugars are high for an extended period of time or go up and down over time, the body doesn't respond well to that. So people have 
kidney disease, blindness, amputations, infections, and it's a leading cause of heart disease and stroke. So having some reasonable control of the blood sugar is critical to managing diabetes well. In addition, the most important treatment for diabetes, insulin, is itself a very complicated therapy. Too much insulin and the body can have a low blood sugar and someone can even have a seizure or die. Now that we have an understanding of the better known forms of diabetes, the next questions are, what is monogenic diabetes and how was it discovered? The word itself isn't hard to understand. Mono means one and monogenic simply means one gene. Monogenic diabetes results from a change or a mutation in a single gene that controls the body's ability to make insulin. And while there are far fewer people with this form of diabetes than have type 1 or type 2 diabetes, there's still an enormous number of people in the United States alone that have one of these forms of diabetes. We estimate somewhere between 250,000 and 500,000 people in the United States and upwards of 5 million people throughout the world have one of these forms of diabetes. Over time, researchers have been able to identify mutations in more than 20 genes. Some mutations trigger diabetes in small babies, typically before six months to a year of life. This is called neonatal diabetes. Others cause diabetes in older children and young adults. For example, one group of diseases that causes diabetes in children and young adults is called MODY, or M-O-D-Y, that stands for Maturity Onset Diabetes of the Young. This group of diseases can affect children with diabetes at a very early age into early adulthood and can be an important source of diabetes in those people. We're seeing more and more of these cases every day. No matter what a person's current age may be, the most important question is how old was that person when they were first diagnosed with diabetes? One of the first patients in the world to be treated for monogenic diabetes was a young boy named Jack. Raising two young sons 14 months apart is challenge enough, but when your younger child is born and is deathly ill, the challenges you face are devastating. Jack is 14 years old today. He lives with his family in Essex, England, and was one of the first to be tested for this genetic mutation and to successfully transition off insulin. But that didn't happen until Jack was five. Looking back, those first years of his life were touch and go. He was underweight um, and um, when we brought him home, he never really was quite right. I didn't settle with him. He was a very unsettled baby. Um, he never slept through the night um, or even slept for more than about an hour. Um, he um, just wasn't right. I had a feeling that he wasn't right. He was born with a cleft lip, so I wasn't able to feed him myself, unfortunately. And then when he was about 10 days old, we rushed him off to the hospital and um, took him to the children's ward. And when we got there, they whisked him away and did all sorts of things to him. And then um, we were sitting in the room, they were putting tubes and needles and things in him. And then they checked his blood sugar and um, they didn't know whether he was gonna survive because he was so dehydrated from the high blood sugars and um, it went from there, really, and that's when we found out he was diabetic. It was awful. Sorry. You wake up one... You wake up every morning wondering whether this is the day that... the day that they're gonna die. Sorry. For the next five years, Emma and her family did their best, constantly monitoring and changing Jack's regimen. But despite their efforts at home and frequent trips to the hospital, during those early years, things were never right for Jack. And diabetes wasn't his only struggle. When Jack was about 15 months old, I started to realize that he wasn't progressing as well as his brother had. 
Um, there's only 14 months in between Jack and Tom. And so I kind of had a fairly good sort of yardstick to go by and Jack wasn't crawling and he wasn't babbling like um, other babies would normally. Um, and he just seemed very distant. Over the next few years, Jack was repeatedly tested and ultimately had a brain scan to see if doctors could determine the source of his physical and mental delays. He wasn't talking. He didn't walk till he was two and a half. Um, so um, it, we, we then started going down the road of having a, 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 a child with special needs. So Jack was five, he still wasn't talking, he was still very delayed in his development, and um, life was still very difficult. But in April 2004, that same year, an article appeared in the London Telegraph with news that would change Jack's life forever. The work of Dr. Andrew Hattersley and his colleagues had a stunning impact on a developmentally challenged toddler who walked for the very first time after going off insulin. So I hunted Dr. Hattersley down through the internet and he was in New Zealand at the time. So I got in contact with him and I tested Jack's blood and 10 days later, Dr. Hattersley called me and said that Jack had got the gene that they'd been looking for and let's try and get him off insulin. I remember when Jack's result came through, I wanted to ring his mum straight away and decided to go out into the field because it would be quieter there. And I was looking out over the hills around as I was explaining to her that we had indeed found the mutation and that Jack was going to be able to change his treatment. And both of us cried. It was a very emotional moment. Jack was brought to a hospital in Bristol where he began his transition off insulin and on to a new life. In less than 10 days, Jack was weaned from injections and has responded perfectly to his new oral medication ever since. But Jack's remarkable story still had one more chapter. When we got back from the hospital, Jack went to school. Um, he wasn't talking at this point. He'd never spoken. Um, we were using a picture communication system, um, little cards that Jack would hand to us if he wanted a drink or wanted anything in particular. He, he'd never made anything other than noises all of his life. And five weeks after, five weeks after he started on the medication, he walked out of school with his teacher who had a massive smile on her face and he walked up to me and he said, hello, mummy, for the first time. They were the most beautiful words I've ever heard in my life. Hello, mummy. So how and when did scientists actually discover the genes that cause monogenic diabetes? And once these genes were found, how were they able to solve the mystery as to why these affected cells weren't working? The distinguished list of all those who helped map this journey is long. Too many to individually recognize in this program. But we will highlight several whose vital contributions helped to make this dream come true. The story was born out of curiosity more than half a century ago. For it was then that experts began to question why some people just didn't fit the typical profiles associated with either type 1 or type 2 diabetes. Many suspected genetics were involved, but no one person has done more to answer this question than the late Dr. Stephen Fines of the University of Michigan. For more than 60 years, Dr. Fines conducted clinical trials with hundreds of members of one family with multi-generational histories of diabetes. His focus was to determine how genetics might affect their disease, their family members, and their treatments. 
In 1964, Dr. Fines, one of the most highly cited experts in the diabetes field, identified the Modi type of monogenic diabetes, which is usually misdiagnosed and treated as type 1 or 2. His clinical research with Modi families laid the groundwork for other scientists to build upon and discover other forms of monogenic diabetes. One of those geneticists greatly influenced by Dr. Fine's work is Dr. Graham Bell from the University of Chicago. Dr. Bell began his work in 1980 studying the genetics of diabetes and has since cloned and identified many of the genes that are key to regulating insulin. The mission of our work is to understand why some people develop diabetes. And when I began the voyage um, almost 30 years ago, one had the sense that diabetes existed in two flavors. And it was, we call them at the time, insulin-dependent and non-insulin-dependent diabetes. Over the years now, we've been able to sort of go into both groups of diabetes both major forms of diabetes and show that actually each are composed or comprised of many different diseases. Dr. Bell, collaborating with an international team, has identified specific genetic mutations and his current work has helped personalize treatments targeted for monogenic diabetes. It is now my great pleasure to introduce the 2013 recipient of the American Diabetes Association's Banting Medal for Scientific Achievement Dr. Graham Bell. In June of 2013, recognized by almost 10,000 of his peers, Dr. Bell was awarded the Banting Medal for Scientific Achievement, the highest honor bestowed by the American Diabetes Association. Around the same time that Dr. Bell was beginning his distinguished career in Chicago, 4,000 miles away in Exeter, England, another gifted scientist was beginning his. My first interest in diabetes was when I first started at Cambridge and my best friend had type 1 diabetes. From that moment on, I thought this was an area of medicine that I wanted to be involved. And suddenly I found myself in a very exciting world where we were finding new causes of diabetes and able to give help with that. As a physician treating patients with diabetes and as a scientist studying the disease for nearly 20 years, Dr. Hattersley and his colleagues wanted to understand what causes children to be born with diabetes. They were quite sure that the answer would be found within the insulin-producing cells. One scientist working on that theory with Dr. Hattersley was Dr. Anna Gloin, a molecular geneticist. My role really working with others was to identify uh, candidate genes that might have been uh, responsible for this genetic condition. And we systematically selected uh, potential genes to uh, investigate in the laboratory. So I would uh, identify a candidate gene, I would design an experiment, and then I would test that uh, hypothesis in the laboratory. In the summer of 2003, one critical gene was found. It was a monumental turning point in our story. I will always remember the day in late June 2003 when Anna Gloin walked into my office. She was a remarkable scientist who'd been working very hard to try and unlock the secret of neonatal diabetes. She came in with a big smile. She'd discovered it. We had found a change that was present in the children that wasn't present in the adults, and that meant this was the cause. This was the reason that these children had neonatal diabetes, and now we could go on and think about treatment. Dr. Anna Gloin had identified the cause, a flawed part of the cell that controls the release of insulin called the potassium channel. And in those diagnosed with neonatal diabetes, this critical channel didn't work. That's why they needed insulin shots. The next question was, could this be fixed? No one better understood the complexities of this channel than Dr. Francis Ashcroft, a brilliant professor of physiology. Dr. Ashcroft arrived at Oxford University in the early 80s, devoting her career to studying insulin cells and conducting research in monogenic diabetes. With Dr. Gloin by his side, Dr. Hattersley made a phone call to his close colleague, a call he will always remember. 
immediately we knew we had to contact Fran Ashcroft and tell her about it because she'd been working on this particular channel for most of her life and was the world's expert in it and we needed her help to move things on. I've never forgotten the phone call I got from Andrew in the summer of 2003 when he called me together with Anna Gloin and the very first words he said were, Fran, I've got something exciting to tell you. I think you'd better sit down. And then he told me that they had found the first mutations in the channel that were associated with neonatal diabetes. Well, you can imagine I was over the moon because I'd been looking for these for years. I was sure they must exist, but we hadn't been able to find them. The problem posed to Dr. Ashcroft was, how could this potassium channel be fixed so that the cell could release insulin on its own? Her answer came a few months later. After countless trials and errors, Dr. Ashcroft was working alone in her lab when she realized she had just discovered how to correct this affected channel. And it was incredibly exciting. It was, you know, if I've ever had a eureka moment in my life, that was the eureka moment. Dr. Ashcroft had discovered how to awaken the sleeping cell. By repairing the potassium channel, insulin could now be released normally. Amazingly, the answer was a common pill that had been used for over 50 years to treat type 2 diabetes, a medication called sulfonylurea. The discovery that sulfonylurea tablets could be used in neonatal diabetes was, if you like, the last piece in a jigsaw puzzle. It wasn't a discovery in isolation, it was a discovery on the basis of everything that had gone before. This final piece fit perfectly, but only because the rest of the puzzle had been assembled over decades and by many hands. So why was solving this puzzle so important? We've done studies throughout the world and they've all suggested that only between 5 and 10% of patients with monogenic diabetes are correctly diagnosed. And that really matters because they're on the wrong treatment. And if we can find them and diagnose them, then we can get them on the right treatment, which will be better for them and better for everyone. Scores of distinguished researchers, physicians, and families have been part of this historic journey to a miracle, the discovery of monogenic diabetes and its treatment. Beginning with the research of Dr. Fines in 1950, this pursuit took more than half a century. Norway, France, England, Italy, Holland, Japan, the United States, and others. And the roads traveled have crisscrossed the globe. And in August of 2006, their work was recognized in a groundbreaking study published in the New England Journal of Medicine. In 2009, another historic chapter was written. The first International Neonatal Diabetes Conference for Families took center stage at the prestigious Royal Society in London. Inspired by their English colleagues, leaders at the University of Chicago in 2010 and 2013 brought together hundreds of doctors, researchers, and most importantly, families from all over the world with all forms of monogenic diabetes. They came to meet, to bond, to share their special stories, and to thank their special heroes. These events will always be cherished, for it was a time for everyone to celebrate their miracles. I'd like to say thank you for all the people that made this all possible. You changed my life in ways that I can't even explain. You made it so I can actually have a future and I can do things that I love to do. We're putting six shots on him every day. Of course, I'm grateful. He had other problems, but just not think, thinking that I don't have to put any insulin shot on him, that, that made my life. I was diagnosed at age 15 with what I thought was type 1 diabetes and had resigned myself to a life full of insulin injections and finger pricks. 
And by fate, I had come across an article about monogenic diabetes, and it forced me to get a second opinion. I've been free from insulin injections from, for four and a half years, and I'm so grateful for the discovery that they've made. April 21st, I get an email from Sean Edler saying, your daughter has the mutation V59M, and she can be transferred from insulin to sulfonylureas. So let's do this. And so we went in the hospital for about a week and a half. We did the transfer, and, <laughs> and it happened. All the progress, you know, I see in her. We've come so far. This is just a wonderful, wonderful experience. We feel so blessed that uh, there's this treatment for Cooper, that Cooper doesn't have to go through daily uh, shots of insulin. And it's just, it really is a miracle. We definitely feel that's what happened to Evan is a miracle. Um, we're, we know that we're very blessed that um, he, he's no longer on insulin, that he can live a normal life, that he can, um, participate in school birthday parties and you know if he skips a meal he won't have to be injected with glucagon. We, we definitely feel blessed and it is a miracle. We're very fortunate. Uh, we don't know why we have this uh, blessing. Uh, we, we thank God for the miracle of his birth and then the miracle of his transition from insulin injection to oral medication and uh, we know there's another miracle coming and we're, we're, we're open for it. We're ready. Everyone that transitions has a powerful story, and collectively they've woven a rich tapestry describing the miracle that they all embraced. But there is one inspirational story that has especially brought public identity and worldwide attention to monogenic diabetes. It's the story of a remarkable and brave young lady named Lily Jaffe. Her journey began in February of 2000, only a few weeks after Lily was born. Lily was just one month old when during a routine checkup, her pediatrician discovered glucose in her urine. A follow-up blood test confirmed her family's worst fears. Instead of returning home for a cozy nap, baby Lily was rushed to the hospital to be treated for what doctors then only knew to call type 1 diabetes. The doctor prepared Lily's parents for a life caring for a child with diabetes, saying, this changes everything. And indeed, from that day on, Lily and her family's life were never the same. From the moment that we brought Lily home from the hospital, our family, Mike and I, were in a high state of alert. We tested her blood sugar 10 to 15 times a day, even at night, and even um, several times during the night. We had to analyze everything that she ate or drank in order to give her the proper amount of insulin to cover the carbohydrates. It was like learning another language for us, and it was a new way of life. But over time, even though it was difficult, we accepted kind of a new sense of normalcy in our home. Over the next several years, Lily and her family did adjust to what they would call a new normal. Some days were better than others. But very late one night, when Lily was only four years old, trauma struck their family once again. I woke up to blood-curdling cries, um, almost groans that I had never heard before. And I turned on the light, and I saw Lily convulsing with her eyes open wide, with her eyes bulging, her limbs tense, shaking, and I knew this was the day that I had dreaded would come. She was having a seizure that was caused by seriously low blood sugar. When I had a seizure, I got a really bad nightmare. I, was, I felt like the shaking and my and, and I felt my body shaking and 
Um, I've, and I didn't even know that I had one, but I, f I felt shaking in my body and I had a bad nightmare. And um, that's what was really scary to me. Several months later, Lily had another frightening nighttime seizure. Her doctor then recommended a change in treatment and prescribed an insulin pump to help stabilize her blood sugars. Again, Lily and her family adjusted to a new normal. But it was in June of 2006 that Lily would forge a new direction in her journey, a turn that would change her life forever. Lily didn't know it then, but she was about to become part of medical history. Her father, Michael, heavily involved in fundraising for diabetes research, was attending a lecture. Some things are just meant to be. And in June of 2006, we had the annual meeting of uh, the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation's Board of Directors. Dr. Lou Philipson from the University of Chicago was, was there. I'd heard Lou speak before, and again, he did always has wonderful things to say, but it's all stuff, frankly, that I had heard. And I was discussing the recent um, events in science, which related to type 1 diabetes. And I mentioned in passing, more than anything else, that it was clear to us that the genetics of type 1 diabetes was very important, especially in extremely early onset diabetes. And again, I had never seen a case, nor at that point had I even heard of a doctor who had seen a case other than Hattersley himself. And, I, and I'm thinking, I can't wait for his speech to end because I've got to go, I've got to talk to this guy. I mean, now on the other hand, I'm internally thinking, it's probably nothing, but wow, isn't it fascinating? And after giving that lecture, a gentleman came up to me and said, I'm Mike Jaffe, and I'm a member of the JDRF here, and my daughter had diabetes at about one month of age. And all of a sudden, his nose and my nose are this far apart, and we lean in, he goes, one month. What was her birth weight? So I can still feel sort of electricity that went up and down, uh, because I never expected anyone uh, to say that really, because of the rareness of the, of the disease. That next week, Lily's DNA was tested to see if she carried this rare genetic mutation, and her family awaited the critical call with the answer. I'll never forget, never forget, I mean, it, like it was yesterday, I can remember, um, when the phone call came, and it, it was Dr. Philipson, and I'm welling up with emotion. I mean, my, I've got the biggest lump ever in my throat, and as he's starting to talk and was just starting to open up about, well, the, res the results came in and we've done the sequencing. And I said, Dr. Phillips, let me stop you. And I could barely get the words out as, and I'm starting to cry. I said, the person you really need to be telling whatever you're about to say to is Lori. I picked up the phone my palms were sweating, my heart was racing. I could barely hold onto the phone. I was so jittery and excited, hopeful, but trying to protect myself from possible disappointment. And I saw the look on Lori's face and suddenly she starts to shake and cry and we're all crying and it was just this absolutely exquisite, incredible, outrageous moment Lily had mutation. We're in the game. We're in the game. Lily was indeed in the game. And the outcome changed her life as it has now transformed the lives of so many others around the world. I think really a very clear example of how patients have made a difference is Lily Jaffe. Suddenly her story spread and a personal story had far more impact than anything that could be done in the conferences or lectures. And I think to see how things have spread and how rapidly America has moved to the very forefront of research in neonatal diabetes and properly treating these patients is an outstanding example of why patients matter. Oh, look at you, you're so attentive, so smiley. As a pediatric endocrinologist, when I meet a patient for the first time who has diabetes, my goal is to figure out what kind of diabetes do they actually have? And so I tend not to assume that they might have one of the most uh, common forms of diabetes, 
but rather really look into it as carefully as I can to see if there's any chance that they might have one of these more rare forms of diabetes. Diagnosing and treating patients with monogenic diabetes since 2006, Dr. Siri Greeley understands it's important to get the diagnosis right. So if I find any evidence that they might have one of those, uh, I really try to do whatever testing or get whatever information I need to figure that out. So what this means is, however old person with diabetes is, if they were diagnosed in the first six to nine months of life, they should definitely have a genetic test, and that test should determine whether they have monogenic diabetes, and if they do, what type it is. And that's really important because that's going to alter the treatment that they get. When diabetes symptoms emerge early in life, neonatal diabetes is often mistakenly diagnosed as type 1. Likewise, some older children and young adults are assumed to have type 1, but actually have MODI. This means that up to a half million people in the U.S. and 5 million worldwide have the wrong diagnosis and might be able to switch their treatment from insulin shots to oral medication. Because monogenic diabetes is a genetic condition, the only accurate way to diagnose it is through genetic testing. Performed by a number of academic and commercial organizations throughout the world, the patient's DNA is analyzed through either a blood or saliva sample. And for those diagnosed with certain types of monogenic diabetes, that treatment means transitioning. And for the physician delivering this life-changing news to a family, it's something very special. I think it's just, it's a rare uh, opportunity in a physician's life to feel like we really are truly making such a big difference in the lives of families. It's, it's really a wonderful thing and uh, I feel very grateful. Michaela is three years old. She lives with her younger brother Jameson and her mom and dad Stephanie and Scott outside of Toronto, Canada. Scott's parents, Tom and Anne, live close by and always look forward to spending time together. They're extremely close and a very special family, as well they should be, for Michaela's story has transformed three generations. Michaela was only six weeks old and very sick when her parents rushed her to the emergency room at four in the morning, placed immediately in intensive care at Sick Kids Hospital in Toronto. All Stephanie and Scott could do was wait and pray. So it was about three days into our stay at SickKids. Uh, Michaela had already been admitted and she was in the ICU. She had been diagnosed and being treated as a type one. She was on insulin. Uh, they were bringing her blood sugar down with insulin. And our endocrinologist brought us out into the hall. And I, I specifically remember this, even though we had been awake for about three days. Uh, and she sat us down and said, you know, we know that there might be, there's a chance that she might have a genetic form of diabetes. She said, we're suspicious that this could be what it is. We'll take her DNA and send it off to the UK's where they sent it, and, and we'll go from there. After eight days in the ICU, Stephanie and Scott brought Michaela home and entered the daunting world of managing their baby daughter's diabetes but they also waited impatiently for news from their endocrinologist. News they had no idea would have such a profound impact on all of their lives. It was about, it was shortly after my birthday in the middle of April that I remember, actually it was two days after my birthday, I remember specifically because they called and it was the best birthday present I've ever received. <laughs> they called to say that she didn't have type one diabetes and that she had this genetic form and we would get to start the protocol to transfer her off of insulin. Michaela did make the transition off insulin, and in less than a week. But her amazing story began to take another unexpected turn. Because I had been diabetic for so many years, since I was six months old, um, the hospital figured, you know, let, let's take your blood on this too. Um, there's no sense in just testing your daughter and not you as well. So I went down to the lab just after my daughter had been tested. They took my blood and they sent that away to the UK as well. Um, explain the same thing, you know, I could have the exact same mutation and maybe I could get off insulin as well. Two days after receiving the wonderful news about Michaela, 
Scott, who had been insulin dependent for 33 years, received his results. When I found out I could transition off insulin, I, I almost kind of didn't even believe it. I was like, yeah, it just seemed crazy to me, you know? I mean, it was all I've known. I've never known anything else other than being a type 1 diabetic. I mean, it's defined parts of my life. So uh, the whole idea of not being on insulin was just, it was very foreign to me. I was excited though. Michaela transitioned and Scott had transitioned. So was it too much to imagine that Scott's dad, Michaela's grandfather, who also has diabetes, could transition as well? Tom's case was different because he was 21, I think, when he started showing signs of type 1 diabetes. So I asked if they would test him. I think everyone was a little bit skeptical. They said they would try. So uh, they actually tested him at SickKids, uh, which is funny because he was a you know 65 year old man checking in at a hospital for ch sick children to get a blood test and uh, they they took his DNA and sent it off and of course they came back that he was had the same mutation and that they would be attempting this transition that they did with Scott with Tom. I still remember when I first heard that the news that Tom had monogenic diabetes I was standing outside a store and he called me on my cell phone and he said I tested positive and I just stood there and cried and I thought you know what he's been given a lease on life he's been given extra years and that was my thought and that's the thought for all of them to have this gift handed to you at 65 years old is, is absolutely phenomenal um, and to be able to uh, you know look at, at life so differently and, and uh, going forward and knowing that you know, you aren't going to run into the, the uh, side effects of diabetes, which is, is really the, the, the big worry for every diabetic. Obviously, for Scott and, uh, and Michaela, well, I mean, they've been given a clean slate for their life. And, wow, that's pretty important. I sometimes forget, but it's such a beautiful gift. I think that, that's the, the words that I would use. It's an absolutely beautiful gift. Um, Michaela is going to have um, an ordinary life, and the same thing applies to both Scott and Tom. And as I say, it's just a beautiful gift. Michaela and her family have received a beautiful and unexpected gift. A gift made possible by a global community of dedicated scientists whose contributions have touched so many lives, like Michaela, Lily, and Jack. And the results of their work have also had a profound personal impact on these scientists as well. Dr. Ashcroft started her life as a naturalist. Living in the small country village of Dorset, England, at an early age developed a love for nature, wildlife and flowers that sustains her today. Following her studies at Cambridge and a short time in the United States, Dr. Ashcroft found her permanent home at Oxford University in 1983. It's here, on this historic campus, that Dr. Ashcroft has devoted her life's work to diabetes research. But she never imagined that her work in a laboratory would reach so far beyond and help so many. I have been extraordinarily fortunate as a scientist because, amazingly, our work has turned out to have an effect on people's lives in my lifetime. Now, as a scientist working in a medical uh, area, you, you always hope that your work will have some benefit, but you never actually imagine it ever will. And in most cases, it never does. So I have been immensely privileged that it has done so. And I think I've been even more privileged to have met the people it's helped. In 2009, thanks in great part to Dr. Ashcroft's efforts, the first neonatal diabetes conference in the world was held in England. And it was here that Fran Ashcroft, after three decades of work in a laboratory, would finally see, meet, and hug the true heroes in her life. I had corresponded with them by email, but here I actually met them. And it was truly overwhelming because the most extraordinary thing is to have people come up to you, fling their arms around you and say, I just have to hug you. 
you saved my child's life, which is of course wrong. You haven't saved that child's life. You've just helped it in some, some way. One of the most memorable people that Dr. Ashcroft met in 2009 was one very special young girl who left her with a simple token of appreciation, an ongoing reminder in Dr. Ashcroft's life. I was even visited once by, by uh, Lily, the wonderful Lily, who, who came to the lab and left behind on my board this marvelous piece of writing that says, um, thank you, love Lily. I haven't ever had the heart to wipe it off because this is so emotionally important to me. And when, when experiments don't work and things go wrong, I can just turn and look and see that, you know, this supports me further on. There is no question for Dr. Ashcroft that her most cherished moments have occurred outside the walls of science. For her, it has been and always will be meeting young people like Lily, who have now become part of her family and who have found a special place in her heart. I feel loved. I feel loved by all these people and it's just wonderful. And, um, and another thing is, um, I don't have any kids of my own, which I would like to have had. And um, in some funny way, I see these children here as part of my family, even though they're nothing to do with me. But I kind of hope that in some way, I have touched their lives a little, and it's just wonderful. Like Fran Ashcroft, Dr. Graham Bell has devoted his career to the genetic science of diabetes. Conducting his research at the University of Chicago, Dr. Bell's life has changed as a result of witnessing the dramatic impact of his work on people's lives. The work that I've done in the area of neonatal diabetes has affected me directly because not only am I involved in the area of scientific discovery, but I've had the opportunity to meet the patients as they've uh, come to the University of Chicago for their care and treatment. And that has changed my whole view of uh, genetics of diabetes. And actually, when I saw the miracle unfolding for these patients, it's actually caused me to sort of redouble my efforts and to try to find cures uh, for other forms of diabetes. Dr. Bell is a man whose work defines him and inspires him to reach beyond. When I began my research career many years ago, I had no imagination that I would reach the point that I am today where the work that we do has a direct impact on individual lives. It not only changes the life of the child that is switched from insulin to pills for the treatment of their diabetes. It changes the life of the family and it changes, also has changed the life of the investigative team. And not only myself, but the students, fellows, and technicians that work with me, their lives have been changed as well. Touching lives, changing lives, by dedicating their own to something they believe in and hope for. This is what inspires these special people. Living in one of the most beautiful parts of the world, Exeter, England, Dr. Hattersley relishes the calm and serenity of his home and surroundings. A gentle, humble, and reflective man, it's his work that truly motivates him, energizes him, and makes him most proud. I'm a very fortunate man because I have a fantastic co combination of work. I do work where I am a diabetes doctor and look after patients, and I do other work where I work with patients to make scientific discovery. And what the lovely thing is when those two bits come together and when the scientific discovery starts to move over to helping patients, I think is one of the most exciting and most enjoyable things that you can be involved in. I just feel very happy to be able to do that. For Dr. Hattersley, it's a keen sense of pride that he feels 
a pride shared by all of his colleagues. I think for everybody in Exeter, there is an enormous feeling of being part of something bigger. I think to have had the opportunity to make a change in people's lives is something we never expected, but for it to have happened and to be involved in that process has been quite simply the best thing that we've ever been involved with. Being part of something bigger than oneself, that's what this story is about. It's not centered on a single person, event, or discovery. It's about all of these things, these lives and moments beautifully joined to form a life-changing journey, with science and humanity blending the way that they should. Changing one's treatment from insulin injections to pills. Medical experts call it a transition. Families call it life-changing. But everyone touched by this discovery calls it a miracle. We would just like to, to thank all of the doctors, all of the scientists and researchers who have spent years um, coming to this development because it has truly changed our life. So we thank everyone involved um, from where we've been to come today as well as where we know we're going to go in the future because I know the research hasn't stopped and the efforts aren't stopping, and we're just thrilled to be a part of this amazing journey. We trust that you feel a sense of hope after hearing these inspiring stories, and it is our hope for anyone suffering with diabetes or any chronic disease that you may someday experience your own journey to a miracle.